Ara sí? Ara, ara. És que no havíem connectat la... Molt bé. Bon dia i bona hora. Ja tornem a ser aquí. El professor Heiligen, teniu el seu currículum aquí, un currículum molt reduït, evidentment, perquè vam haver de retallar. És professor a la Universitat de Brussel·les i, com comentàvem ahir i vam fer una mica de resum de la seva feina, es dedica a la recerca interdisciplinària i transdisciplinària i té un grup de recerca que s'anomena Evolució, Complexitat i Cognició. Ens ha semblat molt interessant de portar-lo aquí perquè tots els seus escrits intenta d'establir unes bases filosòfiques, epistemològiques, també conceptuals, terminològiques, per a la complexitat. I aleshores li agraïm molt que hagi accedit de venir a parlar a la Universitat de Barcelona i li cedeixo la paraula perquè segur que el temps l'aprofitarà millor ell que no pas si estic aquí perdent-lo parlant d'ell. Moltes gràcies. Fins ara. Hello? Yeah, ok. So, as you hopefully have understood from the introduction, I'm not a linguist, I'm a specialist in complexity. This seems to kind of... Hello? Yeah, ok. That means today I'm going to give you a kind of a general introduction to complexity, but with an emphasis on applications which I hope may be useful for a research group interested in um, society and language. Hello? Yeah. That's better. Uh, complexity is a very complex domain. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be much better now. Uh, it means I will have to, of course, summarize to go about the most important concepts that I believe are important, and then I will discuss a number of concrete applications summarily, briefly, but just to give you kind of a feeling, kind of a taste of what the implications might be for uh, communication and for language in particular. First, very briefly, what is the complexity paradigm? The complexity paradigm is to be contrasted with the older paradigm, which I call Newtonian or mechanistic, which is the paradigm that developed during the 19th century and which was for a very long time kind of the dominant scientific paradigm. That Newtonian paradigm is characterized by a number of very fundamental assumptions. The first assumption is the assumption of reductionism. It says that if you want to understand any phenomenon, you have to take it apart, you have to analyze it into its constituents, into its elements. If these elements are still too complex to understand, you need to take them further apart into smaller constituents, and you do that until you go to the basic constituents, which then typically are atoms or particles. At that moment, you are ready to understand the system. The complexity paradigm on the opposite tells you that you cannot understand a system just by taking it apart. Taking it apart can help you understand certain aspects, but the system as a whole is more than the sum of its parts. The system as a whole has certain properties, so-called emergent properties, that you will not find by looking at the parts. A second basic assumption of Newtonianism is that at bottom the world is deterministic. If you have taken your system apart up to the level of the particles and you know the positions, the speeds of those particles and the forces that work on them, in principle you can predict the complete future trajectory of those particles, so you know everything that could possibly happen. The world is determined, there is no choice, there is no uncertainty. Again, the complexity paradigm says the opposite. The complexity paradigm says that the world is basically uncertain. It is, to start with, far too complex for us to take it apart. And second, there are all kinds of mechanisms like chaos, like quantum uncertainty, 
uh, like stochastic interactions that make that we will never ever be able to predict the trajectory of a complex system. Third basic assumption of Newtonianism, which is that at the bottom, reality is based on matter. If you take things apart, you end up with particles. These particles are bits and pieces of a substance that we call matter. And that substance is all you need to produce any kind of phenomenon. So anything you see around you basically is just arrangements of matter. In the complexity paradigm, we are not interested in the basic constituents, we are interested in the emergent properties, and these emergent properties, as we will see, are basically a matter of organization. It's not what the parts consist of, it's how the parts are put together, how together they form a complex whole. So instead of looking at matter as the ultimate category, we will look at organization as the ultimate category. That implies, among others, that the old idea of a mind-matter duality, that either you have material entities or you have some kind of a mysterious mind that would direct some of these material processes, that doesn't make sense. There is no stick difference between mind and matter. They are both forms of organization. And whether you look at molecules, at cells, at people, at societies, you will find organization at all these levels. And as this organization becomes more complex and more adaptive, you will tend to call it mind, or at least use mental type of categories to describe it. As you go more to the bottom to simpler system, you will tend to more see them as matter. But there is no real separation between mind and matter. All is a form of organization. The final assumption of the Newtonian paradigm that is questioned by complexity is the idea of reversible evolution. In the Newtonian paradigm, all change we see around us is basically just movement. The particles move from one state to another, and that movement could have gone in one direction, but it could just have well gone in the other direction. Every change is reversible. You can move from A to B, or you can move from B to A. It's essentially equivalent. That implies that there is not really any progress there is no development, there is no evolution, there is no creativity in the Newtonian paradigm. It's like the movements of the planets around the sun. The planets just turn around the sun, and whether they turn clockwise or counterclockwise, for the laws of Newtonian mechanics, it doesn't make a difference. It's purely regular movement without any kind of a development, any kind of a creativity in it. In the complexity paradigm, instead of speaking about movement, we will see change in the first place as evolution. That means a process in which new things are generated, and these new things typically, but not always, will be more complex than the things that were there before. The new things that are generated typically will also be more adaptive, more intelligent in a way than the things that were there before. So in the complexity paradigm, there is some kind of an arrow of time. There is a development towards more advanced forms. To make it a little bit more concrete, I will start with the basic concept in complexity science, which is often called complex adaptive system. Depending on the author, different terms may be used, but what is a complex adaptive system? It's basically a collection of components, subsystems, and these components we call agents. These agents are not independent, they interact. When the one does something, it will have an effect on the other one, and the other one will react. So all the agents are interacting. This network of interactions will be characterized typically by self-organization. Self-organization means that the interactions between the agents initially happen locally. One agent interacts with its neighbor, but eventually that leads to a kind of a global coordination. The system as a whole becomes coordinated, becomes ordered, becomes organized, and as a whole starts to adapt to new circumstances. Some typical examples of complex adaptive systems, well, practically any kind of a social entity, a society, an organization, a group, a community, a social network, these are all complex adaptive systems. Obviously, the agents are the people in them, 
the communications, the collaborations, or the interactions. Uh, the internet is also another typical example. In the internet, you not only have people, you also have uh, computers, you have databases, you have all kind of communication links. All of these interact and adapt. Markets is an example that, of course, economists like. In markets, you have buyers and sellers, two transacting things, they interact, and out of that, emergent phenomena may appear. And finally, everything in biology, ecosystems, organisms, they are, of course, complex adaptive systems consisting out of individual animals or cells. On to the notion of agent. An agent is a very general uh, notion that could apply to a molecule, to a cell, to uh, a person or to an ant. In this case, since I will be applying to complex uh, to social systems, I will basically speak about the social variant. That means I assume that an agent is a person. But what I'm going to say is, in principle, generally enough to, to apply to any kind of agent. So an agent is an individual that can be distinguished as a separate entity, which is goal-directed. That means the agent has certain preferences. The agent tries to achieve certain things rather than others, and usually in models that is conceived as some measure of fitness, utility, benefit, the agent somehow tries to maximize or improve at least its benefit. To do that, the agent needs to sense its local condition. It needs to perceive what's the situation. It compares the present situation with the ideal situation, let's say, with its goal. It sees what's the difference. It then decides about an action to reduce that difference. Since the agent wants to move towards its goal, it will act so as to minimize the difference between the present situation and the goal situation. When the action is not sufficient, the new, a new situation will be created that may not still be the goal, so the agent will always monitor the result of its action, see what's a new situation, and if necessary, perform a new action. So there is a feedback loop going on by which the agent is constantly correcting its actions. I want to argue that agents in general exhibit cognition. That's my thesis about mind-matter duality, whether agents are supposedly material entities like cells or uh, even molecules, or whether they are people. I consider that intrinsically they are exhibiting some form of a co cognition. Agents need to survive and be successful to be there in the first place, otherwise they would have disappeared. That means they should be able to solve problems. If the situations are not right, they should know what to do about them. That implies intelligence. That implies perception. They should be able to gather information from the environment. They should be able to process that information. They should be able to interpret what that information means. If they see that the situation is different from the situation they would like to, there is a problem. They need to think of a way to solve that problem, they need to think about the strategy, they need to decide about the right action. So all of that requires some kind of an intelligence. In simple agent, that intelligence will be very simple. It will be just a few rules that say, if that situation, then do that. In more sophisticated like agents like people, it implies a whole brain. But another fundamental assumption in complex adaptive systems is that whatever intelligence the agents have, it's very limited. They may be very smart, but their rationality is bounded. To start with, agents never have complete information. They only have a bit of information about their local circumstances. Second, even that little bit of information is a very big deal if you have to process it their capacity for processing information is limited. So they can't do too complex uh, reasonings, too complex computations. They live in an environment which we assume is complex and unpredictability. We know, for example, from chaos theory that very tiny perturbations in the environment may lead to very big changes. So in essence, even if the agent had almost complete information and were able to make 
almost perfect computations with that, the environment would not allow them to predict it perfectly. So the conclusion we have to draw is that while agents try to do the right things, they do not know what is the right strategy. They only can predict in the short term and even then they often make errors. That means that agents will have to correct their actions. They rely to some degree on trial and error. They perform an action maybe in the hope that it will be successful, but if they notice that it's not successful, they need to correct it. They need to do something new. That means that these agents need to be intrinsically adaptive. If something doesn't work out the way they expect it, they need to change so that the next time they are more likely to do the right action, so they need to learn to adapt. Now I come to the idea of uh, self-organization. Self-organization is the idea that a complex system will spontaneously order itself. What does it mean spontaneously? It means that there is nobody in control. There is not a single agent either inside the system or outside the system that tells the agent, that tells the system what to do. Insofar that the process of self-organization takes place, it's not centralized. There is not a particular place where it all comes together. The process is distributed. That means it's delocalized. It happens at the same time in all the different parts of the system. That leads to a kind of an emergent order, and this emergent order, a typical property is that it is robust. Robust means that if things go wrong, if perturbations, if errors happen, that order will not typically fall apart easily. Precisely because it is distributed, precisely because it is uh, present in lots of different places, if something happens to one of the agents, it will not affect the system as a whole. So how can we conceive of this process of self-organization? At the most basic level, it's a process in which one agent aligns with another agent. I will go into more detail about what alignment means, but alignment in essence means that one agent adapts to another agent and vice versa until they somehow are in synergy, fit together. Now, one agent aligns with another agent, typically the neighboring agent, the agent that it has most direct contact with. When those two, two agents achieve alignment, then a third agent may join that alignment, and a fourth agent, and a fifth agent. So the alignment has a tendency to propagate and to extend ever farther. The result is that the local order that started by some alignment between two or three agents kind of tends to go until it covers the whole system, and that is what we call a global uh, order from local interactions. It implies a nonlinear process of amplification. Small changes in the beginning may go until they cover the system as a whole. This is the example I always give in my courses and in my lectures about self-organization because it's about the simplest example. This is an example actually from physics. The little arrows that you see on the left represent molecules that have a magnetic field. A magnetic field points in a certain direction from south pole of the magnet to north pole. Initially you have a disordered system. All the different molecules, for example, in a piece of iron, point in different directions. Now, those molecules will start to align because if one north pole of one molecule points towards the north pole of another molecule, there is a kind of a repulsive force. You have, if you have put two magnets together, you will notice that if you push the wrong poles to each other, there is a repulsion. If you push the right poles together, they will attract. So you have a little bit of the same process here. The different molecules interact. If they align, that means if their magnetic fields point in the same direction, they kind of reinforce each other's magnetic field, and the result is that this alignment becomes stronger, produces a stronger field, and in the end, you end up with all the magnets pointing in the same direction. That is a very basic paradigm. It's very simple, and as you will see, it can be applied even to uh, social systems. I want to go a little bit deeper into this mechanism of self-organization. 
the way I understand it, people speak often about order, but order in such is not an interesting category for me. What I am interested in is what I call coordination. Coordination means that the agents, and especially the actions that they perform, become somehow arranged in such a way that they collaborate, that they work together, that they work in an efficient way. That means, on the one hand, that the actions of the different agents should not obstruct each other, they should not conflict, there should not be any friction between the one and the other. If, for example, two cars both try to pass the same narrow passage, and the passage is too narrow for the two cars to go, and they both try to pass, they obstruct each other, neither of them can pass. That is a situation of conflict or friction. That is a kind of situation that you want to avoid. On the other hand, what you want to achieve is what is sometimes called synergy, or what we make also called cooperation. That's a situation in which the actions of the two agents not only do not obstruct each other, but kind of reinforce each other, help each other. Together you can solve more problems than alone. So how am I going to achieve that? I'm thinking in terms of local interactions. One agent initially interacts with another agent. I assume that agents are adaptive. If they see, if they somehow perceive that the action doesn't give the expected or the desired result, they will try again with a different action. So if they interact with a neighbor and the result is bad, if there is friction, if there is conflict, they will typically try something different the next time. If the next time the result is good, that's to say the effect, the interaction is synergetic, then they will tend to keep to this good thing. So the general principle is that negative results are suppressed, positive results are reinforced. That's very local, that's just one agent interacting with another agent. It just doesn't know anything about what the others are doing. The first stage is this kind of local alignment. The second stage, as I said, is that this local alignment kind of grows, propagates throughout the whole. This typically happens in a non-linear way, a positive feedback. The, the larger the aligned assembly is, the quicker it goes, and that means that you can very quickly get the whole system arranged. That has the advantage that you very quickly can get organizational order, the disadvantage is that sometimes it may be too quick. It may be too quick in the sense that it amplifies small errors that actually may not be what you want. I will give some examples of that. The end result I want to go to is what I call distributed cognition. So I assume the agents and their actions are coordinated. Coordinated now means that they are working together. They are working together to a common goal. Implicitly, I assume that synergetic interactions are actions that work towards similar goals that reinforce each other. And since I assume that any agent is intelligent, I have now created a kind of a super agent, an agent consisting of coordinated agents that super agent must itself exhibit cognition, must exhibit intelligence. That intelligence is what we call collective intelligence. It's an intelligence that is typical for the group, for the system as a whole. It cannot be reduced to the intelligence of its members. I assume that the group as a whole has a form of intelligence that the members do not have. <coughs> I use also the term distributed cognition to be able to analyze this a little bit uh, more precisely. When I speak about intelligence, I mean, in general, the ability to solve problems. When I speak about distributed cognition, I'm looking in more detail what happens where. So, if agents together have to solve problems, it means that one agent maybe needs to do one thing, and another agent needs to do another thing, and a third agent needs to do a third thing, and they need to do that in a certain place, at a certain time, that's the problem of coordination. So distributed cognition is the idea that the problem solving is distributed, is separated in different subtasks, and that the right agent does the right task at the right moment. 
in the end, I assume that all these subtasks together lead to one global solution. So this is a kind of a graphical depiction of how a distributed co cognitive system could work. Assume that this is an organization, let's say a research center. You see information coming in, that information reaches certain people within the organization. These people partly process that information, they may be make some decisions, maybe add some insights, maybe reformulate it in a different way. They pass on their partial solution to somebody else, to one or more people, who make further decisions, who make further processing, who may use some of the tools like books or computers to help them process this information. And in the end, the, the, the decision is made, some actions are performed by some of the people in the system. So. Uh, what you see here is one global system. Here is the incoming information that the situation has experienced by the system. Here is the outcoming information. Uh, can you see that? Yes. The outcoming information, these are the actions performed by the system. So looking from the outside, this is one integrated system. Looking from the inside, it's actually a network of lots of different agents doing different things. So that is kind of the ideal I would like to get to. Unfortunately, as you see with my transformation from a file on the Macintosh to a file on the Windows, some of the pictures haven't come to, but these particular pictures are not so important, so we can miss them. Uh, what I want to explain here is the notion of collective intelligence. So collective intelligence is simply the idea that as a group, as a collective, we can be more in intelligent than individually. And the typical example, and that was one of my pictures, are social insects. Individual ants, individual bees or termites are very stupid creatures. They know hardly anything, yet together they can do quite intelligent things. They can build very sophisticated nests. They can produce uh, kind of maps of their surroundings with trails of pheromones that point to all the important things. So we know that collective intelligence exists. On the other hand, it is not necessarily so that the group is always more intelligent than its members. There are also exceptions, what I might call collective stupidity, which I will also give some examples of. Uh, here I want to uh, refer to a very interesting book uh, by an author called James Surowiecki, and the book is called The Wisdom of Crowds. He has, in a very readable style, not at all technical, reviewed quite a lot of examples of collective intelligence, and most importantly, he has tried to formulate requirements, the most important things that you need to achieve collective intelligence. And there are four requirements. The first one, in a sense, is the most obvious. It is diversity. If you have a group consisting of different individuals that together should exhibit collective intelligence, then you want those individuals to be different. If all these individuals would be exactly the same, it would mean that they would know exactly the same. It would mean that they could solve exactly the same problems. It means that together they would just solve the same problems as they would have done individually. What you want for a collectively intelligent system is that your different individuals have different knowledge, have different experiences. The one knows something about one topic, the other knows something about another topic, the third one knows something about a third topic, and by grouping all that knowledge, all that experience together, you may hope to get something that's much more than they could have done individually. But that immediately puts you for a problem. It's not sufficient to have lots of experienced people together in one room, you need somehow to get that information out of their heads and to synthesize it into a collective solution. That is a problem that Surawiecki calls aggregation. Aggregation is actually the most difficult part of the whole collective intelligence problem. There is one case in which it works very well, that is if you have to make a quantitative decision. And a typical example is you sometimes have this in games. I put a very big pot here that is full of beans, let's say. And I let people guess how many beans are in the pot. 
Of course, nobody can guess exactly how many beans there are in the pot, but everybody writes a number like, let's say, 534, 728, 1005. And then you collect all these numbers and you make the average. And what turns out, if you make the average of lots of different guesses, that average typically is much more precise than any individual guess. That is one very simple example of collective intelligence. The reason is that all these people have some experience with maybe guessing what might be the number of beans in a jar, but they all have incomplete information, they all have biases, they all have limited perception, but because the one has another perception than the other, they tend to compensate the one for the other, so if you just average them, you get a good uh, solution. So averaging is a very simple method of aggregation that works very well, but it only works if you have a single number. It doesn't work if you have to make a decision uh, about like, for example, what should be the strategy of our company for the next few years. Third requirement uh, of Surovieck is independence. Independence is basically the idea that when the agents together come to their solution, you should not allow some agents to kind of dominate all the others. That typically happens in meetings. You have a firm, you have a meeting about the future strategy. It's typically the boss of the firm who will have the strongest influence and all the ones below him who will tend to say, yes, 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 you are right, whenever he suggests something. While they may have actually much better ideas of their own, but they don't dare to say them because he is the boss. So that kind of a problem is what you need to avoid, the problem that a small subgroup can somehow dominate the uh, final result. And the final requirement uh, that Surovieki mentions is decentralization, or what I would prefer to call distribution. That's what I have already uh, hinted at a couple of times. That is that ideally you want to have different individuals focusing on different tasks at the same time. They should be able to work in parallel so that the one can specialize in one type of task, the other one in another type of task. Well, this was a picture just of some people discussing in a group. I uh, just insert that here because group discussion is, let's say, the most typical way for hopefully developing something like collective intelligence, but it's not the best way. It's not the best way. Here I have inserted a slide with a couple of examples of empirical or computational studies of this process. There are lots of studies, especially in social psychology, in what is called group dynamics. Here I have grouped a couple of experiments and simulations that are more uh, starting from the complexity paradigm. The first one, which is one that should certainly be recommended for anybody interested in language and complexity, that is the talking heads simulation which was done by my colleague Luc Stales of the Free University of Brussels. Luc Stales is an artificial intelligence researcher who is also a linguist and who has been specializing the last 10 years in the evolution of language and who has been uh, creating simulations of how agents can develop together a vocabulary, a grammar, a whole language. There's a second simulation that I will uh, refer to. It's a simulation that was done by my colleague Frank van Overwalle, who is a social psychologist with some of uh, my input. It's called the talking nuts simulation, like talking heads, the previous one. It's clear that there is some influence, but the, the emphasis is different. It's different types of agents. It's a different uh, style of interaction. There's also a very interesting experiment that I will say a little bit more by Lyons and Kashima. That's, a, that's an experiment in which a story is passed on from person to person. And finally, there is an experiment that is still being analyzed. That's an experiment that I set up together with a student of mine here at Bebout, where uh, we will see there was a group discussion that exhibited collective intelligence. Uh, I have defined the problem of self-organization or distributed cognition basically as a process of cognitive coordination. Now, what does it mean, cognitive coordination? I will 
distinguish four aspects of cognitive coordination. I will especially emphasize the first and the second aspect, but for completeness sake, I will also give you the third and the fourth. The first aspect of coordination is that the agent that interacts should agree about common standards. For example, if you communicate, you should agree at least about common words to designate the things you are speaking about. If you are, uh, for example, traveling in a city, you should agree about basic traffic rules. For example, that you drive on the right side of the road and not on the left side of the road. In Britain, everybody drives on the left side left side of the road, that's okay, as long as everybody does the same. If some people drive on the right side, some people drive on the left side, that's a recipe for disaster. So there are a lot of situations which the first thing agents need to do is agree about a kind of a common convention, a standard, a way of doing things so that they don't misunderstand each other, they don't get confused, they don't get in conflicts. It has lots of application. The whole of language is basically about reaching this kind of coordination. You need to agree about rules of phonetics, rules of vocabulary, rules of grammar. Otherwise, you won't understand each other. Also, the whole domain of politics, of morals, is about agreeing about laws, about norms, about ethical rules. All that is a question of consensus building. A second type of uh, cognitive coordination is the one I was already speaking about, which I called aggregation. It's not just a question that you should agree about a single thing. You should also bring in lots of different points of view and try to get the best out of each one. Then the two other uh, aspects of cognitive coordination about which I will not say much here because they don't have direct uh, implications for linguistics or communication, but which I consider very important in general. That is what I call division of labor and workflow. Division of labor, it's the idea that different agents perform different tasks at the same time. But that means that you have to agree about you do this, I do that. At the same time, simultaneously, Different people do different things and there needs to be some kind of an agreement so that whatever needs to be done is done and preferably by the person who is most competent to do it. Division of labor means that you allow agents to exhibit their specialization. The ones who are best at doing a particular task should do that task and vice versa. Workflow is the idea that tasks are not only done in parallel, simultaneously, some tasks need to be done the one after the other in the sense that you first need to finish something before somebody else can continue the work. So here it's a question of sequential ordering. I do this task first and then when I'm finished you can continue with your task on the next one. So a problem that needs to be solved, that cannot be solved by a single individual, typically one person will do part of the task and then pass it on to the next person. I'll give you one example uh, with uh, building a house. If you build a house, you start by building the foundations, building the walls. Once you have the walls, you can put the roof. Once you have the roof, you can start on the inside of the house starting to put electrical cables in the walls. You can also start to put uh, tubes for the water and gas in the walls. The one task is specialized for electricians. The other task is specialized for plumbers. Well, the plumbers and the electricians can work in parallel. They are not obstructing each other. They both need to have a house that is uh, free from rain. It needs to have a roof. But once there is a roof, they can start doing this task and they can work in parallel. Once they have put the tubes and the electricity in the walls, then somebody else can come to put plaster on the walls to finish off the walls. Once the walls are finished off with plasters, the walls can be painted. So you have different tasks. Some tasks are performed in parallel, like laying electricity and plumbing. Some tasks are performed sequentially, like plastering followed by painting. I will not speak further about these types of coordination. I will speak 
mostly about the simplest type of coordination. That's what I call reaching a consensus, agreeing about standards. What is the dynamics there? I assume that agents have a position. They have a certain opinion, a certain idea on how to do things. And I assume that the agent in the group will start by expressing their position. Other agents in the group will hear, perceive that position, and they will be influenced by it. If somebody presents the same position that I already had, my own opinion will be reinforced. I will become more convinced that that's the right one. On the other hand, if he presents a position that's different from mine, I will tend to shift my position. I will tend to shift my position a little bit in the direction of what the other guy said. That is a very simple dynamics. So I assume all the agents express their position. They all listen to the positions expressed. And then in a second round, they express their new position, the new position as influenced by everything they heard. Typically, this new position will have shifted in the direction of the position that was actually most common, most frequent. So assuming that I have lots of different positions, A, B, C, D, E, and so on, but there are a little bit more agent with position A than with any of the other positions, it means that after everybody has listened to everybody, Everybody will have moved position, but they will have moved a little bit more to the one that is most common. So next time they all express their new position, they will all have moved a little bit to A. They will again be influenced what they hear. That means that again they will be influenced to move a little bit more to A. And after each round there is a little bit more movement to A. And typically the end result is that everybody agrees on A. That is this kind of nonlinear amplification that I sketched about, uh, even in the case of magnetization. So the typical result in this case is what I call homogeneization. The group kind of reaches a consensus. They all end up in the same position, and that same position typically is the one that happened to be the largest one. It may be that it was just a tiny bit bigger than any other position, that's not important because of this nonlinear amplification, the one that's a little bit bigger grows more than the others and therefore you have this self-amplifying growth. It means that in the end, the ones that had a different opinion tend to give in because more and more others all say we should do A, we should take position A, and in the end, usually the last ones will give in and support A. That's a very simple dynamics. Usually it's a little bit more uh, complicated. It's more complicated if the group is not really a homogeneous group, but there are subgroups, and the subgroups do not communicate as much between groups as they communicate within a group. That's, for example, the case of a language. You have two neighboring language communities, let's say two villages. People will much more communicate within their own village than they will communicate with the other village especially if the other village is difficult to reach, for example, because there is a big river or a mountain in between the two villages. So in these cases, cases of geographical separation, or it might also be a kind of a social separation because you have two sub-communities, let's say immigrants uh, and the original inhabitants or people that are Protestant and people that are Catholic, when there is some kind of a separation between the communities, they will communicate less across communities than within communities. What happens now is within each of the sub-communities you will have the same dynamic that the larger position, the position with the most adherence will go and go until it becomes homogeneous, but now it will become homogeneous within the sub-community. I'll illustrate the two dynamics again with magnetization that the slide I originally showed. In this case, I assume that all the magnets, in this case, I could see those arrows as people. Each direction is a particular position that the person has, a particular attitude that the person has. After self-organization, I assume they all become homogeneous, they all point in the same direction, they all have the same attitude. On the other hand, if I have this degree of geographical separation, what may happen is that locally they align but because they have more local contacts with their neighbors, with the people in the same community, in the same village, they will tend to agree within this local community, but 
there is less communication with the ones outside the community, which means that the others may uh, settle on a different result. And then I can get a, a partitioning where I have in this case three groups, an opinion pointing in this direction, an opinion pointing in this direction, an opinion pointing in this direction. Uh, my next slide, unfortunately, is not visible. It's a picture I took from a study of some complexity researchers that used this principle to model uh, uh, Bosnia. In ex-Yugoslavia, you have different communities. You have the Muslims, the Serbs, the Croats. What they did is they took some statistics about the distribution about these communities before the war in Bosnia. They created a kind of computer simulation where uh, the different uh, communities were positioned kind of in a very random way, kind of mixed between each other. And you had different colors for the different communities, let's say blue for Serbs, uh, green for Croats, uh, black for Muslims. And then they had the same kind of a dynamics where you assume that each agent interacts most with its neighbors. If the majority of its neighbors happen to be a certain, uh, belong to a certain community, they will tend to conform. In this case of the Bosnian situation, it's not so much that Muslims will start to agree and become Serbs, it's rather that Muslims would move to a place where there are more Muslims and Serbs would move to a place that there are more Serbs, but the net effect is the same. The net effect is that in a particular geographical region, there will be a tendency to homogenization, but in another region, the homogenization will lead to a different result. And what this simulation actually showed is that these very scattered communities, after a while, become much more homogeneous. But at the same time, you see boundaries appearing between those homogeneous uh, parts, and it's those boundaries which, according to the paper, were the places where there was most conflict. Because the boundaries are the unstable regions. The boundaries are the places where half of your neighbors are the one and half of your neighbors are the other one. And there, there is no clear majority, there is no clear rule of the one that is the strongest. So this model, for example, was, was used to explain uh, uh, ethnic conflict. There is another uh, complication. Then the complication is called polarization. I sketched the dynamics in which, if there is a particular opinion, let's say A, that's a little bit more frequent than the others, the group will tend to settle, to reach consensus on this one position. But what can happen is that not only they settle on this one position A, but they become more radical. This is typically the case where you have to decide between alternative courses of action and there is kind of a continuum. A typical example is a meeting of uh, military and politicians that have to decide about what is their attitude towards a particular country. For example, now let's say Iran is not uh, listening to the recommendations of the United uh, uh, Nations they, are, they want to enrich uranium. There are different options. The one extreme may be we attack Iran, we bomb them. The other extreme may be we give in, we make peace to them, we give them what they want. These are the two extreme positions. In between, there are all kind of compromise positions, such as we put an embargo on them for certain things so as to put pressure on them. So they are all kind of intermediate positions. What may happen with polarization is that you start with a group of individuals that have different positions on the issue, but there is, let's say, a small minority for being more warlike, less peace-seeking. And because of this process that if you hear more agents giving a particular position, you will tend to shift your position in that direction. But now you have the additional effect that not only will the people state their position, they will also give arguments why that position is good. And these arguments will kind of reinforce the position. If in the beginning they were kind of hesitating, like should we make peace, should we make war, and there would be arguments both per war and arguments per peace, if there is, let's say, a slight majority that is slightly more inclined towards making war, those 
will start to give more and more arguments that group will go, and as they go, they will think of more arguments for why they should go to war, they will hear less arguments for why they should make peace, and the result is that they become more extreme, they become more radical. That is the process that's called polarization. The result can be very bad. The result is something that the sociologist Jan is called groupthink. It means that as a group, you make decisions that are very irrational, that are kind of overlooking lots of important arguments,